Okay, this is going to be an analysis of my recent debate with Matt Dillahunty on is belief in the resurrection unreasonable? And let me start by saying this. Um, I don't really feel super good about this debate. I mean, what I mean is I have real mixed feelings about it. Uh, many people were left with the impression that Matt had demolished my arguments, while some others were left with the impression that he didn't touch my arguments and that my case was solid. My own opinion is that the logic and facts of the debate were with me, or rather with the case for the resurrection of Christ, but that the rhetoric is where Matt did do better than me, I fully admit. Um, part of this is because in debate, there's always a number of things that are left unanswered. And part of this is because probably my own inexperience with debate and not having more skill at it uh, meant, means I don't have the developed those sort of you know, techniques of handling the rhetorical things that Matt did. But another part of it is due to the fact that it's just hard for people to really track with the substantive points in a debate and to weigh what is said carefully. And when you can't do this, especially in a rhetorically charged environment, when you're having a hard time doing that, persuasion tactics and rhetoric can take over your perception of the logic and reasoning in the discussion. So I want to evaluate the logic and the rhetoric of the debate and see if it impacts um, how you view it. In fact, please let me know in the comments below if, if this uh, gives you a different perspective on the debate, if perhaps you were one of those who um, you know, thought the rhetoric dominated. So there's another reason why I'm doing this though, and that is uh, Matt came to the debate with a lot of the same kind of stuff you're likely to encounter when you talk to some people about the truth of Christianity. If you're a Christian or you're a non-Christian, he said some of the things you're gonna say to people as well. And um, he's very confident, he's intelligent, and he's well-spoken. But if you can learn to spot the key issues in Matt's actual like argumentation, then you'll be able to spot a lot of the stuff you hear in a lot of conversations. So whether you watch the debate or not, I think this may be useful for you. And I'm going to warn you guys, this is a long video. So to help you out, I'm, I'm going to put um, a few timestamps down in the, the description below the video. There's going to be a ton of links in the description. And if you feel like you're just getting tired of hearing about the historical analysis and you want to jump to the philosophical side of things, I encourage you just don't skip a whole section because there's a lot of really important stuff in here. I hope that you'll take the time to watch the whole video. I think you'll find it fruitful. Um, it may help you not only understand this debate, but better understand the case for the resurrection and be better equipped to see the rhetorical, uh, powerful irrationality that people are sometimes trying to pull when we bring these things up. So Matt's position, um, his position seemed to center around three separate tactics, three, if I just kind of put them in categories, three main tactics for coming against the case for the resurrection. One, I will say was a flawed treatment of history. Now that's a bold claim I'm making, but I'm gonna support it with just you know step by step here in this video. Two was a flawed epistemology or flawed philosophy um, that would suggest that supernatural claims aren't even conceivably possible to prove, or at least that's the implication. Allow me to unpack that when I get to the philosophy side. That is probably the, the biggest issue in the debate, or at least you know one of the two biggest issues. And then number three, finally, I'll just mention some more random things that I just think ought to be brought up that relate to rhetorical stuff. Um, so we'll just call that section of this rhetorical randomness that'll come towards the end. So this is all important stuff. If I lose you, go to the video description and just click ahead so you can skip to something you find more interesting. But I do hope you'll uh, have the time and attention to pay attention to the whole video. So um, before we get into evaluating Matt's positions and statements, I need to briefly remind you what my case for the resurrection was because his responses to me won't make sense without having this fresh in your mind. So uh, I'm not going to give you my opening statement from the debate again. You can go back and watch that. Um, I am happy with my opening statement. I, th I thought it was I thought it was well presented, uh, and I I would encourage you to check it out again if you want to hear the full case. And I think that's smart. But here's the basic idea. Um, there are these sort of, and I'm not going to read through these right now, but there's these sort of 12 facts of history. I call them facts. By fact, I just meant it's well evidenced historical stuff. And so um, you can read through this. You can get a screen cap of it if you like. These things are um, 12 facts that are non-miraculous. That is, none of these things thems in themselves are any in any way miraculous. So you can't miraculously object to these things. They're all well attested, meaning there's multiple lines of reasoning that suggest that each of these facts is true. We don't just find them in one source or something like that. Also, the majority of scholars actually agree on these 12 facts. There's 
there is um, majority agreement and it's not just evangelicals it's like across scholarship and uh, some people picture scholars as though they're all just these Christian scholars and that's most certainly not the case in scholarship um, yeah so so these facts these 12 facts they should not be controversial what I, I've done is I've, I've summarized them in 12 individual words that you could just kind of I could throw up on the screen here and I did this in my opening statement um, these should not be controversial this is like giving us a good common ground right that Jesus died by crucifixion that um, the disciples lost hope because of this, that he was entombed, that there was then an empty tomb found, that James, the brother of Jesus, was converted after he seems to have seen or at least believed he saw Jesus alive from the dead. Um, anyway, it just goes through all these 12 facts. Um, I'd like to go through them carefully one by one, um, but I think most of you watching this have probably already heard this. So I want you just to remind yourselves now that, that there was a uh, several facts of history, you know, well evidenced and majority of scholarship agreeing on these facts of history that we started our case with. That's how it began. Uh, the next step in the argumentation though, because it's a historical question, so the, the next step in the argumentation was to say, hey, um, what's the best explanation for these 12 facts? And that was to gather, let's gather a few possible explanations. You know, we, we you could say, well, they hallucinated. You could say it was a conspiracy. You could say it was legend. Or you could say, well, no, Jesus actually rose. And we talk, I talked about this stuff in my opening briefly. Um, and how the resurrection definitely accounts for all of the available information. You know, when you look at all the historical data from the first century, the resurrection fits it perfectly. Whereas each of these other alternate explanations, they tend to fall short in several respects when compared to what we would consider to be accepted facts from history. Um, so... That's like, in a nutshell, my case. And it's based on historical data, a group of candidate explanations, ruling out the, you know, bad explanations to get us down to a good explanation that not only is it not a bad one, it, it accounts for all the data. This is a um, technique called, it's not super fancy, but it's just called inference to the best explanation. Inference to the best explanation is a well-respected principle of how to obtain justified true beliefs. It just asks what best explains these facts. So hallucination, no. Conspiracy, no. Legend, no. Resurrection, yes. This is actually, you guys, this is not Mike Winger's special, you know, historical judo trick. This is just how historians do history. They evaluate based upon, uh, you know, when they compare their candidate explanations. I'll use that term because Matt will use it later on. I'll show you the clips. Um, they evaluate these things based upon explanatory scope, explanatory power, degree of ad hocness, plausibility, and illumination. Um, I won't get into a full description of that. If you're curious, uh, Mike Lycona has written a book called uh, the, um, the Resurrection of Jesus, A New Historiographical Approach, and he spends a big portion of the beginning of the book establishing how history is done, and that may help people on that. So the point here is that Jesus' resurrection fits the data, and to put it plainly, the evidence from the first century sure makes it look like Jesus rose from the dead. Now, now that you've been reminded of really briefly um, my case for the resurrection, uh, which is, in, in all honesty, more robust than probably it sounds as I'm trying to speed through it because this is going to be an extremely long video, um, I want you to be able to see how Matt responded to it because that's really the main thrust of this video is to talk about the response to that thing. So let's talk about the first major issue in Matt's reasoning, and that is going to be, and this is going to take a big, a, a big chunk of time to walk through, but it's a flawed treatment of history. Matt presented a very flawed, and I'll demonstrate this, a very flawed treatment of history in his rebuttals to the things that I was saying. Um, and the reason why this matters, of course, is because Jesus' resurrection is a historical issue. It happened in time past, right? And if we don't have a good treatment of history, we're not going to even be able to have a good evaluation of whether Jesus rose or not. And I do think that was that treatment of history was crippling uh, Matt's perspective in regard to evaluating the historical data. So of all the stuff Matt said, this is the thing I've heard more than anything else. Um, this is the one thing. And it's, it's how Matt and many others will dismiss the evidence for the resurrection. So let me play this little compilation of clips and see if this doesn't sound familiar. <laughs> um, I presented a, a group of pieces of evidence, evidence like... Um, like the, the New Testament documents, evidence like extra biblical literature, stuff like Roman historians, uh, archaeological evidence, medical research. There's a whole bunch of support going into these facts of history, these 12 facts. Here's how Matt just sweeped all that evidence right off the table with the following phrase. And what Mike has kind of done at the start of this is to say, well, 
really, here's all this evidence, and it's the evidence for the supernatural, and you don't just get to throw all of it out. But it's not the evidence. It is the claim. It is a bunch of claims, and it is claims upon claims as well. When you present these things as evidence, they are, in fact, just more and more claims. Reports of appearances of Jesus are not appearances of Jesus. That's just a claim. The claim and not the evidence. This happened a lot of times throughout the debate. And again, I've heard it so many times, like since then, I say so many, it's not like a hundred thousand times. I've, I've heard it like a dozen times. Somebody sent me this thing, Mike, those are just claims, not evidence. And people find it very persuasive. Um, it's, I'm going to call it a meme. Okay. The, the meme is claims, not evidence. Those are claims, not evidence. And this, it's interesting how a careful historical case can be built and a meme for at least some people, can dismantle that whole case. So I do think we should talk about that meme. Um, so I have three problems with the meme, claims, not evidence. And you should have these problems too. These are not my private opinions. In fact, I'm going to quote a historian to help back me up here on this. Um, so listen up. If you were influenced by Matt and you thought that this was a really good reason to throw out all the evidence for the resurrection of Christ was because that's not really evidence. Those are just claims. Problem number one. Problem number one. The statement those are claims not evidence is a claim I, I wish i had pointed this out in the debate it maybe a mistake of mine that i didn't um but think about it those are claims not evidence that's a claim that means this meme proves itself wrong because in fact not only is this just a claim but everything that matt said in the entire debate was just a claim so if we can say that claims don't count as evidence, then his entire case falls apart. By Matt's reasoning, you don't need to listen to Matt. Uh, or, or for that matter, a scientific paper. Because as you're reading a scientific paper, you're not actually looking at science. You're looking at claims about science, right? In fact, most of what you think you know about how science works or about what science says isn't based on your own experiments, right? But it's based on the reporting of others. It's based on their claims. So immediately we should see the first problem is that this is a self-refuting statement and so self-refuting statements can pretty quickly be just set aside and ignored i think um, but this comes down to using like special definitions of words as a way to confuse people about the facts this is why later in the debate uh matt when he was asked like what how do you define claims versus evidence he defined a claim as an assertion and he defined evidence as evidence which doesn't really help us here. The, the, this is your strange definitions for words. You don't define running as, a, as running, evidence as evidence. That doesn't quite work. So the first problem is that this is a self-refuting claim. The second problem, though, is that it reflects a misunderstanding of how history actually functions. When historians are talking about evidence, they are talking about the same kinds of things I'm talking about here. I got it from them. <laughs> you know, that's, that's where we started. We started a historical study. I did and then came and brought that in, in the debate. And um, historians, uh, what they do is, is they dig up an ancient papyri. And what they don't say is, um, hey, uh, boy, I... I really am excited. I found this ancient papyrus, you know, and, and I, I, I've, I can look at it now, but it doesn't mean anything because these, what's written on it are just claims. These are just empty claims that I can just disregard. Like, obviously this isn't the case. Now, if you follow Matt's logic here and, and you borrow it and you use it for yourself, as many people are, uh, that those are claims, not evidence, you're not going to even begin to understand the case for the resurrection and you're going to laugh at it, but the case isn't foolish. It's this position that's really silly. So I realize many of you are not going to take my word for it. And so as usual, <laughs> I want to be able to support the things that I bring to you guys. So I contacted uh, Dr. Mike Lycona in order to get, um, he's the author of the book, The Resurrection of Jesus, as I mentioned before, a new historiographical approach. And I wanted to get some feedback on this concept that those are claims, not evidence thing, right? So I sent an email to Mike and I asked him, uh, hey, Mike, in my recent debate with Matt Dillahunty, he said the regarding the first century evidence surrounding the resurrection, that's not evidence, those are just claims. How would one help an unaware listener understand how this is false? Several people felt this was a compelling dismissal of the case for the resurrection. I especially appreciate your answer as a historian. Now, Mike was gracious enough to get back to me, and I really appreciate it. Uh, what he wrote back was the following. Think this through with me. It's very uh, thoughtful how he put it. He said, Dear Mike, evidence is data used to support a hypothesis. So... Matt shows that he doesn't understand the difference between a claim and evidence. He could say the problem of evil is evidence that God does not exist, and he would be correct. 
but then we can provide scientific data as evidence for a designer and we too would be correct. It's certainly true that the evidence Jesus rose is far superior to the evidence that he did not. Now, Mike's not trying to make a case for the problem of evil. Uh, I think he would disagree with it and uh, I'm sure he would. But the point is that you can present it and say, hey, the problem of evil, here's a piece of evidence I have against God. Now, I can weigh that evidence and evaluate it and see if it really leads to the conclusion. But it's silly to not call it evidence, right? Um, and the same thing here is what, what he's saying about Matt's position is it's, it's wrong. It's, just, it's wrong. Um, so that's not how history works. It's just not how history works. Even philosophical arguments themselves are evidence, Right. And now there are many, especially in the skeptics community, and I'm talking primarily about atheists that I encounter here and talk with, that think that the word evidence is preserved for only that which has been tested through the scientific method, that's evidence, or for only purely physical objects, which the New Testament documents would still be evidence even under that under that concept. Um, but that that narrow view is just plain wrong. Evidence is any data or a physical object that I can bring, or even a, a good idea that I can bring to support a conclusion or a hypothesis to get to get that hypothesis accepted. That's the idea. I like how uh, my friend Blake Junta put it. He says, evidence for an hypothesis is any data or observation that makes the hypothesis more probable than it would have otherwise been. Now we can get really technical with this, and maybe we should, and say that claims and evidence are not mutually exclusive things. So you can't necessarily say those are claims, not evidence, because sometimes some kinds of claims are evidence, some kinds of claims are not evidence, right? Um, so they're not mutually exclusive, um, and that claims, especially in historical documents, they need to be evaluated to see what we can learn from them. So they're evidence, the question is, what are they evidence for, right? You have to explain the existence of that claim somehow. Ironically, right now, Somebody is Googling the word claim, right? To try to prove me wrong. And they're relying on some website to define the word claim, not realizing that if they are as reckless with the word as Matt has been, they can't trust the website because the words on their screen are just a claim. So that's the second problem with this claims not evidence thing. The third problem, the final problem is that if we took Matt's claims are not evidence view, we would need to not only throw out pretty much all of history but most everything you've ever learned from books, articles, or from teachers. I'm not saying that my whole case is, is made by refuting this meme. That's not what I'm saying. I have a lot more work ahead of me here as I'm trying to unpack the debate, but it should be obvious that this meme, claims aren't evidence, it gets us nowhere. It's self-refuting, it redefines terms in ways that historians don't use, and it's certainly not applicable to our debate. And, um, and it results in discounting massive amounts of human knowledge if you actually take it seriously. So now that evidence is back on the table and that, that persuasive meme is, I think, refuted well, let's ask how can historians learn from evidence which comes to us in written form? Because we need to think a little more deeply about this than just memeing it out of existence. Um, so let's say that you wanna know if people, hypothetically, let's do a flat earth analogy since those are so popular nowadays. Um, let's say that you wanna know if people thought the earth was flat during the middle ages. That's, that's what you wanna figure out. And so what I say is, I say, yes, the, uh, no, they didn't think it was flat. They thought that the earth was spherical and I'm going to present evidence. And the evidence I bring is a quote from Thomas Aquinas, which was written in the, 12th, uh, in the 1200s. And here's the quote. It says, for the astronomer and the physicist, both may pr prove the same conclusion that the earth, for instance, is round. The astronomer by means of mathematics, abstracting from matter, but the physicist by means of matter itself. And, and now that's the evidence. Okay, that's. I didn't interpret it. That's just the evidence. Okay, so now what do I do with the evidence? How do I use it to support my hypothesis? Now, you could just say, well, Mike, that, those are claims. That's just a claim. Obviously, that's we're not going to do that because that's wrong. Um, but, but now we can take this evidence and say, what do we do with it? And here's how I would use it to build my case. I would say, well, look, Thomas Aquinas spoke as if this was a known thing, at least in educated circles he was familiar with. He uses it as an example Right In the context of the passage, which I read, he's not making a case for the earth being a sphere. He just casually mentions it as an illustration about some other point. He talked like people in the fields of astronomy and physics had independent verification of the round earth in the Middle Ages. So this, is, this makes it even stronger. Specifically, physics, math, or astronomy, they're figuring out that the earth is round, and Thomas Aquinas says so. This is just one piece of evidence that people thought the earth was spherical in the Middle Ages, so then we could gather more and make an even stronger case. Maybe make a 12-piece case, 12 evidences of it, you know? Or should you just dismiss it as a claim? 
Obviously not. Um, so that's my best explanation for the evidence. I look at the evidence. I gave you an explanation. Thomas Aquinas um, and the people, at least believed the people around him, uh, thought that the earth was round and it was a normal accepted fact in educated circles. But if we take Matt's tactics here and we use it on this Thomas Aquinas quote, then we can apply, uh, apply them like this. I would say of this quote, well, it's possible that Thomas Aquinas was mistaken or that he misreported what people in the fields of physics and astronomy were saying. There's another hypothesis. Okay, so here we go. We've got the evidence. That's the quote. Then we have the two hypotheses. We have my, my hypothesis. It's a candidate explanation. People in educated circles, which Thomas Aquinas was familiar with, believed the earth was spherical and reported that this was the result of the research in their disciplines. And then the, my theoretical Matt. Now, he wouldn't bring this, obviously, but I think he treats evidence when it's not about the resurrection differently than when it is. So the 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 possible response is, well, Aquinas was mistaken. And he did present this as an interpretation of the evidence that they were just wrong. So I could bring more evidence and I could offer that there's other people who are also saying the same thing. I could show you that Thomas Aquinas, that he was in fact a brilliant man. I can look at his writings and say he's obviously well-educated. It's not likely he was mistaken. He doesn't seem prone to make those kinds of errors. And I build my case even stronger and stronger. So we look for the best explanation for the evidence. This Thomas Aquinas illustration brings out another important and often misunderstood issue in the case for the resurrection of Christ. And that is that it's a cumulative argument. We're building an argument based on lots of pieces of evidence and not just one. That's why I brought 12 in my particular. In fact, those were 12 facts gathered by way more than 12 pieces of evidence. Um, so we're, we're making a big case. Um, now, we don't ask a cumulative argument to stand on just one of those pieces of evidence. We put it all together until we can rule out alternate explanations, at least rationally so, and then uh, we have the best explanation that's left. So let me explain. The fact that uh, Jesus was thought to perform miracles, right? That, that is a fact of history, but it doesn't prove that he rose, right? That Jesus thought he was fulfilling Old Testament prophecy, that seems to be a fact of history, but it doesn't prove that he rose. The fact that Jesus had a confirmed death, it doesn't prove that he rose from the dead. I fully admit it, right? Jesus' brother, James, thinking that he saw Jesus alive after death and becoming converted as a result, like that doesn't in itself prove. I'm not putting the whole case on James. Nope, but it's an important piece. Paul's conversion due to what he thought was a bodily appearance of the risen Christ, that doesn't prove that Jesus rose necessarily by itself. A group appearance of Jesus alive doesn't necessarily prove that he rose. The disciples' lives being changed doesn't prove that he rose. The various witnesses being willing to live and die based on the accuracy of their claim that Jesus rose, that doesn't prove that Jesus rose. But when you gather all these details together, it becomes evident that all the individual explanations you might offer to explain away Paul, explain away group appearances, explain away the empty tomb, explain away the death, they all start to fall apart. And the resurrection fits all the data. That's why most people, including Matt, are not willing to suggest alternative hypotheses and actually stick to them. They don't want to give an alternate explanation. They don't like these lists of candidate explanations, right? Matt kind of did this in the debate. If you recall, he said um, group hallucinations are real, which is... I, I disagree, but also the, the literature disagrees, the scholarly literature disagrees that, that real group hallucinations, the kind that could connect to what we see in the first century with Jesus, they just don't happen as far as we can tell. And there's been a lot of writing and literature and research on it. Um, but he says group hallucinations happen, but he won't offer it as an explanation. That's interesting. Why not? Right? He says that mythicist positions are not all wrong, whatever that means, but he didn't offer them as an explanation. Matt said that legend was a potential explanation, but he didn't offer it as the explanation. He said people just lying about this stuff. He said that that was a possible explanation, but he didn't seem to hold that position. So this is, um, this is interesting. He won't hold a conspiracy, hallucination, or legend. He won't hold to any of these things, but he'll imply that they're true. And that is a debate strategy that has more rhetorical power, I think, than it has like logical, rational power. A tactic of uh, some people is to act, though, like this cumulative case for the resurrection when we're handling the history of it, to act like the whole case rests on just one point of the case or each point of the case, such as in the debate when Matt said that the disciples sincerely thinking they saw Jesus didn't mean Jesus rose. Well, I would agree, right? But it is an important truth in the case for the resurrection. It's one piece. It doesn't achieve the whole case, but it sure is valuable. 
Consider the hypothetical murder of Daisy by Bubba. Here's another illustration for you to help you work through the historical analysis of Jesus and his resurrection. So Bubba's on trial for the murder of Daisy and a cumulative case has been made. Several pieces of evidence to demonstrate that Bubba did it. And one of them is, for instance, Bubba's fingerprints. Um, plus he made a death threat. Plus Bubba has abused Daisy in the past. Um, and there's three pieces. It's a cumulative case right there. Three pieces of evidence. Now, are Bubba's fingerprints on the weapon, is that enough to convict Bubba? Well, no. Is the fact that Bubba made a death threat enough to convict Bubba? Well, no, not really. It, Bubba had abused Daisy in the past, but he never killed her, right? So that's not really good enough reason to convict Bubba, is it? Well, no, by itself, no, but the three together present a pretty compelling case. Bubba did it, right? Um, don't ask me why I picked Bubba for the name for that. So you could respond like Matt did, like, oh, we could have better evidence. You could say, wouldn't it be better if we could get Bubba to come today right now and kill Daisy all over again in court for everyone to see? Well, I mean, it would certainly demonstrate that Bubba did this, but it would also be a way of ignoring the data we have in lieu of some hypothetical stuff that you wish we had. And that's another mistake that we can make to avoid the cumulative case for the resurrection. Okay, so what we're going to do right now is we're going to look at a very specific example of one piece of evidence from the resurrection and how Matt handles it. Now, look, I'm not, I'm not trying to be rude to Matt at all. Um, this is about the truth of things, and it's really important that that's the whole point of this public debate, right? Is that we get to the truth of the matter, and I want to make sure that it does get to the truth of the matter. So let's analyze how Matt handles history to see if this is a very good and right and accurate way to handle and portray history. Listen to um, not only Matt's position on the crucifixion, but listen to how he characterizes what evidence we have on the crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, here's the clip. Agree with that. Like, do you agree that he was crucified under Pod? I have no idea. To me, this is largely a storybook that whose veracity cannot be verified. I don't have any way to investigate this. There are no contemporary accounts, not, e not even in the Bible there aren't contemporary accounts. We don't see the sort of things that we would expect. We don't see, uh, you know, the Romans reporting on, you know, it's not like we found a document that shows, hey, here's the date we crucified Yeshua ben Joseph. That, that just doesn't exist. So I'm going to unpack this a, a little bit more as we go here, but what I want to just draw your attention to is uh, how he characterized the crucifixion, right? In the debate, uh, Matt brought brought this stuff up and says, hey, we, we don't have any evidence, really. There's nothing to corroborate it. We just have the Bible, you know, and that's it. And I'll talk more about his treatment of the Bible a little bit later because it, it was muddy. Um, but in the debate, Matt also brought up uh, an email conversation that was between the two of us. Me, I emailed him ahead of time. Uh, I wouldn't normally mention this, especially like in a debate review video, but he brought it up in the debate. So I'm going to mention it today because in that, in that email, uh, which he brought up, he talked about what the evidence for the crucifixion was. Now, back up, right? I sent him an email. I sent him like 10 facts I was working with, thinking about using in my case for the resurrection. And I wanted to know, does he agree with any of these? Just any of them. It, it'll help me understand if we have any common ground. And he responded that he didn't really agree with any of them. Um, and so here's specifically what he said about the crucifixion. He says, uh, my statement was, Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Matt's addition here was, again, that's the traditional report with no supporting evidence. So this is consistent with his statements in the debate and out of the debate. There's just no evidence, Mike. It's not there. Um, and so is there no evidence, right? Is there really no evidence? Reminder now, I'm not attacking Matt personally. I actually feel a, a little bit bad about doing this, but it, it's too important not to. Um, so I think a careful treatment of history is not only important for just integrity and intellectual clarity, but especially because we're going to build a case for the resurrection on history, so we can't be reckless with it. So here are some sources we have for the crucifixion of Jesus. I'll start with non-Christian sources. Um, in Tacitus, he writes about 109 AD, not a Christian source, um, and he wrote about events that happened 64 AD because he's a Roman historian. So he records events that happened in Rome, um, and after a fire, which the populace had thought was started by Nero, and Nero decides he's going to blame the Christians for this. So he writes, Nero fastened the guilt of the burning of Rome. Here's Tacitus. And notice that he's not a Christian. Listen to how he talks about Christians. He fastened the guilt of the burning of Rome and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, 
from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty under the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. Now, the vast majority of scholars will totally grant the authenticity of this passage, unlike what you hear on some atheist websites. Um, its basic ac accuracy, according to Van Voorst, has never been seriously impeached. It's not even really doubted or questioned at all. And there's a lot of reasons why. Uh, just make sure you're getting your information from good sources, right? Uh, Lucian of Samos Sota also mentioned the crucifixion of Jesus. He said in the second century, the Christians, you know, worship a man to this day, the distinguished personage who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. He also adds that the cruci crucifixion took place in Palestine. So where it happened and that it happened. Josephus, in Antiquities of the Jews, he has a long passage where he talks about Jesus. Now, this passage is controversial. It's, it's uh, in his Antiquities of the Jews, um, 18. Now, th this is very controversial, right? Um, but what a lot of people don't realize when they first start Googling their research on the passage is that the part about Jesus being crucified is not controversial. The vast majority of scholarship will agree that Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate, that that is intact in the original, although there was some corruption later on. So there's another source, non-Christian source, Roman source, right? Mara Bar Serapion, in a letter sent to his son from prison, he said, what advantage did the Jews gain from executing their king? It was just after that their kingdom was abolished. And he seems to be referring to Jesus and his execution and that he was proclaimed to be the king of the Jews. Remember what Pilate wrote on top of the cross, according to the Gospels? Well, Marabar Serapion seems to carry a similar sounding uh, concept forward in a seemingly unrelated letter where he just throws it out there. So these are non-Christian sources. There's less useful sources like the Talmud, which also talks about how Jesus was hanged, which would be a reference to crucifixion. They refer to that as hanging as well. So how then is this according to Matt? This is a traditional report with no supporting evidence. Is he just unaware? Like, does he not know that they're supporting evidence? Or maybe he thinks that supporting evidence doesn't count because those are just claims. Maybe he does. I don't know. Also, can I say we don't ignore Christian sources just because they're Christians? That's called prejudice, right? You don't do that. I can't believe that. That came from Christians. We have um, tons of first century sources in the New Testament. And before they were ever called the Bible, we have it in all four Gospels. We have Paul who supports the death of Jesus in every undisputed letter of Paul. He specifically mentions not just Jesus' death, but his crucifixion and his cross in multiple places. Hebrews and 1 Peter were both written in the first century, and they may actually predate the Gospels. And they mention this in multiple places in each of those books as well, the crucifixion. We can go into each of these sources, and we can patiently and thoughtfully analyze them. And this is what scholars do. And this is what scholars have done. And it's certainly not what Matt said in the debate when he says, to me, this is largely a storybook whose veracity cannot be verified. Well, this is this is just not true. It's just a falsity. I'm not able to, I didn't unpack it well enough in the debate in my opinion, but I'd like to deal with it now that I get to talk without anybody being able to interrupt me. <laughs> I have the power. Um, so let's talk about scholarly consensus. I just gave you ancient historical records. Now we're gonna talk about scholarly consensus because almost every scholar in the world agrees that Jesus was crucified and that it is incredibly well evidenced. Let me just read you quotes from different scholars. Now, some of you may think I'm going to reference evangelicals or just Christians. Definitely not the case, right? These are primarily non-Christian scholars who I'm going to quote now. Most of them are non-Christians. So John McIntyre says, even the scholars and critics who've been moved to depart from almost everything else within the historical content of Christ's presence on earth have found it impossible to think away the factuality of the death of Christ. Now notice when I quote these scholars right now, how they use the word fact, a word that Matt seemed to think was inappropriate to use of the crucifixion or of any of the things that I brought when I said these are facts of history. It doesn't mean that there's 100% certainty about it, but it means it's historically likely enough that we go, yeah, we can call that a fact. Atheist, Gerd Ludemann, atheist, he writes, Jesus's death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. The Jewish scholar and atheist, Geza Vermesh, he says the passion of Jesus is part of history. Atheist scholar Bart Ehrman says one of the most certain facts of history is that Jesus was crucified on orders of the Roman prefect of Judea, Pontius Pilate. The Jesus seminar leader, no friend to Christianity, J.D. Crossan says, not the slightest doubt about the fact of Jesus' crucifixion under Pontius Pilate that he was crucified is as sure as anything historical can ever be. 
Paula Fredrickson says the single most solid fact about Jesus's life is his death. He was executed by the Roman prefect Pontius Pilate on or around Passover in the manner Rome preserved, reserved, particularly for political insurrectionists, namely crucifixion. Michael Icona summarizes and says, in summary, the historical evidence is very strong that Jesus died by crucifixion. The event is multiply attested by a number of ancient sources, some of which are non-Christian and thus not biased toward a Christian interpretation of events. They appear in multiple literary forms, being found in annals, historiography, biography, letters, and tradition in the forms of creeds, oral formulas, and hymns. Some of the reports are very early and can reasonably be traced to the Jerusalem apostles. The passion narratives appear credible since they fulfill the criterion of embarrassment and contain numerous plausible details. Finally, the probability of surviving a crucifixion was very low. So the crucifixion, which Matt says he has no idea if it's true, and the impression that the audience gets if they haven't studied these things um, is that there's just really no good evidence for it, right? They're just claims. But this is just a complete mishandling of the data, complete mishandling of, of, of history. And we need to spot these things when we see them so that it doesn't influence our thinking. The crucifixion is so well attested that in historical Jesus studies, when a scholar has to like write a paper where he like reconstructs the life of Jesus and says, I think Jesus's life is like this based upon all this evidence, they're required as part of the criteria to include Jesus's death by crucifixion and they have to explain in their story, well, then what got him crucified? Because they know he got crucified. So it's so strongly attested that it's become a criteria for reconstructing Jesus in historical Jesus studies. Um, the point here is um, a wholesale dismissal of historical study isn't a good way to find out what happened to Jesus, right? Nor are flippant reinterpretations of historical evidence without seriously considering the evidence. And that's what I want to talk about next uh, because we won't be able to see the historical case for the resurrection clearly if we don't deal thoughtfully with historical evidence. So I'm going to talk about some specific examples right now of Matt's treatment of history. Matt offered um, some specific statements that I want to unpack. And it's going to be in this clip I'm going to share with you uh, in just a second here. Um, here's uh, one of the things he said, and listen carefully. In fact, there's a lot of things he said in this clip. So listen carefully. Uh, notice two things. How does this, his statements, how does it make you feel about the evidence for the resurrection? But also, try to identify and categorize the specific claims that he makes, because this is what you've got to do if you're going to watch debates. Think about the specific claims that he makes. Here's the clip. The other thing is that we're talking about something from which there is zero evidence from contemporary sources. And Mike will list a ton of sources none of which are contemporary. Not even the Gospels are contemporary. Paul isn't contemporary. Um, the various historians that people are likely to reference, Cl Clement I is probably the closest to contemporary because he was at least born around the time that the crucifixion and resurrection would have heard, uh, occurred. But at a minimum, when he, becomes, uh, when he gets in a position to report stuff, we're still talking decades later. Okay, so he says there's no contemporary evidence. And, the, and here's interesting, the closest person we have is a guy named Clement, who many of you have never heard of. But he says our closest source is a guy that wrote something, First Clement, which was written after the entire Bible was already written. And But the implication, if you don't know the details of what Matt's saying, you come away thinking, my goodness, there's no credibility in these documents in any way, shape, or form. So we're going to walk through this stuff specifically. So what I, the most interesting thing I find is Clement, uh, that Matt throws out Clement, of all people, as his closest thing to a historical contemporary person. Now, Clement was born on Matt's timeline, was born about 35 AD, and he wrote about 95 AD. That's when we think Clement wrote his, his works, 95. Clement wrote, he calls him the earliest source we've got. Clement wrote after every New Testament document had already been written, every single one, right? Clement is not even remotely our earliest source. Paul, so that's just factually wrong, right? Paul himself was born long before Clement was. Probably he wasn't a whole lot younger than Jesus himself. I mean, unless you think that Paul was persecuting Christians like as a one-year-old, like a little toddler with a, with a rattler smacking Christians. Now, Clement, he wrote in the 90s. Paul wrote his epistles in the 50s. So how is Clement our, our best source? Paul was a living contemporary with Jesus. You know, 
I don't understand how Clement gets in there, except that Clement's not in the Bible. So the impression the hearer has is some dude that's not even in the Bible is a better source than the Bible. And um, that's definitely not the case. And I don't think historians, uh, well, anybody who studies this isn't going to agree with that. Matt's timeline puts Clement writing, interestingly, when he's 60 years old. Why can't Mark write when he's 60? I mean, if Mark was written in 70 AD, right? And you take him as 60 years old when he's writing, just like Clement was, and Matt seems to admit this, then that means Mark could have been in his 20s when Jesus was crucified. He could have been with Jesus, one of the disciples following Jesus, walking with Jesus, right? He could have been one of those alongside, maybe not one of the 12, but one of the, one, one of the ones who was a, a follower of Christ. That's entirely possible, the author of Mark. Did you know that even if you take late dates for the New Testament documents, which Matt does, um, they were all written within the plausible lifetime of those who saw Jesus' three-year ministry. This has been one of the great things we've discovered in the past couple hundred years, is that all these documents were first century documents, not second or third century, which is what the German school was theorizing in the 1700s. No, completely wrong, right? They're all first century. The textual criticism, you know, studying just claims, has proven to us that these were written in the first century. So this means they could have all been written in the lifetime of people who heard Jesus' words with their own mouths, it's potentially possible anyways. It's not. It's certainly not outlandish. Matt doesn't give us that impression though, does he? Uh, maybe he doesn't know, uh, but I don't want you to take his authoritative mischaracterizations of history as fact. Uh, it's, it's unwise. And I'm not trying to pick on him. It's, this is about truth here. Some would say, um, but how can this be? Right? It's, it's in some of your minds right now. How can this be, Mike, when the average lifespan of people back then was like 45 years? And Matt has said that in another debate. I was prepared in case he brought that up in this debate, but uh, but it didn't come up. Um, I would ask you to check that statistic more carefully. It turns out that the first century 45-year lifespan date is based upon a confusion of statistics. The, the people tended to die, to die early, young, and there was more in child death, basically. But if they lived on into their adulthood, they lived very much similar lifespans as we have right now today. And there's even evidence in and outside the Bible to support this. In 1 Timothy 5, 9, it says that widows can't be brought into the, the supply of the church to be given charity from the church um, until they're 60 years old or older. I mean, they die at 45? Well, they can't even be entered into the, the charity roles, the regular charities, until they're 60 or older. In Luke 2, 36, we read about Anna, who was 84 years old. The Mishnah gives stereotypes. It has this kind of funny thing where it talks about what people are like at different ages uh, in the Mishnah, the Jewish work. And it it says uh, descriptions of all the way up until 100. And at 100, it's like, well, you may as well be dead. And that's how it describes you at 100 years old. But obviously, there's people that were that old. In fact, if you just Google the lifespans of Roman rulers, you'll see that they lived much beyond the age of 45. And let's not forget that Matt put Clement at 60 years old when he's writing. Right, so even even if you took the latest books of the latest date of John, right, you've got John. He could have been writing when he was eighty, based on when a young man, a teenager, may have joined himself to a rabbi back then. And there is, um, I could talk more about this, but there's there's plenty of research on this. It's all available out there. We just have to learn to see through authoritative mischaracterizations of history. In fact, I'll put a link in my video description to an article by Dr. Craig Blomberg, where he, uh, has, it's an interesting article. He talks about the potential ages of the gospel writers, and he rightly chastens people who don't test such claims and will allow them, allow these empty claims, bold but empty claims, to cause their faith to teeter on the edge. So I'm going to put that uh, in the video description there, and I hope that you guys find that helpful. But it gets better. It's not just the gospels that are earlier than Clement. It's not just Paul that's earlier than Clement. Um, in 1 Corinthians 15, we have a creed, a statement that confirms the death, the burial, and the resurrection and the appearances of Jesus to individuals and groups. I mean, that's like most of the case for the resurrection. And it confirms all those details. And it traces back to within a few years of the death of Jesus Christ. This is something I've explained in videos before, but I like to unpack it just a little bit. This creed was given by Paul, right? He wrote it. But Paul, who knew Peter and James, mentions that they, in 1 Corinthians 15, 11, Peter and James were preaching this stuff long before Paul had ever started preaching it, right? And he was saved after the death and resurrection of Christ, probably a couple years later. And uh, this confirms, though, that this has always been the message, that the death, burial, resurrection, and appearances to, pe to individuals and groups has always been the message from the beginning, from the eyewitnesses. Now, some people are going to immediately be like, no way, Mike, that's just a bah, this is dumb. Um, but let me tell you a story. <laughs> I went to Israel uh, in, it was 2006, I think it was. 
um, or maybe it was a few years later than that. And I went there and our tour guide picked up this little shard of pottery. And he looks at this pottery and he says, oh, this is from such and such period. And, da, 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 da. and he starts telling us all about the pottery and when it came from and what, what years it was probably created in. And I, I laughed at the guy. I scoffed. I'm, I, I repent. But I scoffed at the guy. And I just thought, yeah, right. Like, you can't look at pottery and tell me how old that is. What I didn't know and what he explained very quickly to us and very kindly and graciously um, was that um, there has been extensive research in pottery and that archaeologists actually use pottery as one of the prime ways of indicating the ages of dig layers. They look at the pottery because pot shards of pottery are abundantly found in ancient, uh, in ancient uh, digs, but also styles of pottery, materials they used, they all changed with time and they're able to actually walk back the timeline of events using shards of pottery. So I felt pretty dumb for oversimplifying the issue and scoffing at this evidence. And that's why I want to encourage you not to oversimplify and not to scoff at this evidence. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3, he says, I delivered to you of, as a first importance what I also received. That's a rabbinic way of saying, this is not something I made up. This is a tradition I inherited. And then what he reads is formulated. It's actually formulated. If you look at it, especially in the Greek, it's really neat. And it says that, um, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So we have the death of Jesus. That he was buried. We have the burial. We have the resurrection. That he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas. That's Peter specifically. Then to the twelve. There's a group appearance. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. Most of whom are still alive. Though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. Then to all the apostles. And then he goes on to talk about Jesus' appearance to himself. Remember in verse 11 he says, They were preaching this the whole time. This has been the message all along. Now, I'm not going to get into all the details of why this is ancient, like how you could look at the pottery and know all these little things about it. But it's not me saying this. The scholars will, will, will all agree, pretty much all agree, except for Richard Carrier and Robert Price, right? They're going to they're gonna be agreeing on these things that sometimes a passage has stuff in it that's much older than the passage itself. It's like a history book with a speech from Abe Lincoln. If you can do an analysis, you can say, hey, this speech, it's a lot older than the book. And this speech or this creed in 1 Corinthians 15, it's older than the book, which was written in the 50s. So it's a creed received by Paul, most likely no later than his first trip to Jerusalem to see Peter, which took place about three years after his conversion. This means that those people, Peter and James and likely others, were really teaching these things at the time. We have a really good reason to think so. Reginald Fuller, he puts it this way. I'll quote some scholars now to help support me here. It is almost universally agreed today that Paul is here citing tradition. Jerome Murphy O'Connor says the complete agreement that Paul introduces, um, reports, excuse me, that there is complete agreement that Paul introduces a quotation in verse 3b. This is complete scholarly agreement across wide swaths of scholarship. Habermas says that most scholars who provide a date think that Paul received this creedal tradition between two and eight years after Jesus' death. So it was formulated and it was being preached. And then he got it two to eight years after the death of Christ. The atheist Ger Ludemann, he says the elements in the tradition are to be dated to the first two years after the crucifixion of Jesus, no later than three years after the death of Jesus. This is powerful because the question again is, do we have anything that's contemporary with the events? Uh, Jewish scholar Pincus Lapid helps us understand the implications of this and says that this passage can be considered as a, quote, statement of eyewitnesses. I got to read that to you again. He says, the passage on your screen can be seen as the statement of eyewitnesses. What is the thing that uh, we really want to see? We want to see really, does it go back to the eyewitnesses? Were they really saying it at the time? The answer is going to be yes. German historian Hans van Kampenhausen said about the creed that we're looking at, this account meets all the demands of historical reliability that could possibly be made of such a text. Now, Matt certainly doesn't treat history this way, but this is how the historians are treating the same content. It's, the, it's a source of the highest possible quality. And what does it record? May I remind us, right? The death, burial, resurrection, appearances to individuals and groups, including Peter and James, and then finally, Paul. This is what you call really solid evidence, not just claims. And um, it's not, it's, this is just one piece of evidence. We have lots of pieces of evidence in the case for the resurrection of Christ. It doesn't all hang on 1 Corinthians 15. That's just one piece. 
So again, Matt, uh, he mischaracterized the nature of the evidence ultimately. And whether it was on purpose or not, it was not accurate. That's my main point here. Okay, let's shift gears a little bit. There's an, another issue uh, related to the treatment of the Bible. And it's a subtle issue that people can often do. This is really common. It's certainly not just in the debate with Matt. This is really common to do. And it's when we mistakenly treat the Bible like it's really just one source. So listen to this clip where uh, Matt makes a whole bunch of statements about the Bible. Notice, though, among other things, he treats the Bible as if it's just one historical source. That's the main issue I want to talk about here. So listen carefully to what he implies, even if it's not always clearly stated, what he's implying about the Bible. Oh, there's multiple attestations, yes, in the Bible, which is a, a hand-collected uh, set of books that were considered divinely inspired while disregarding other books that were considered divinely expired like Shepherd of Hermas and others um, and then getting rid of books that had information that wasn't the same and it's possible that we have um, we, it's possible the Bible may be the most accurate record of all of that my my claim or my point that um, that it was put together by men over a period of time and Athanasius of Rome just made a list and everybody said yep that's the list uh, that doesn't change whether or not it's true or whether it is the most accurate telling. But even if it's the most accurate telling, that doesn't necessarily mean that what it's telling is accurate. And even if it were largely accurate, that doesn't mean that there's sufficient evidence to warrant someone today believing that that's the case. Okay, this is the kind of thing that happens a lot in these conversations. I call it dumping because... Um, a lot of what he said was just kind of some things that were disconnected and unrelated. And he started talking about one thing and it's kind of talking about something else. Um, but they all have one thing in common. They're talking all about the Bible, right? The reliability or the trustworthiness or the usability of the Bible when trying to determine what historically happened. So we're just going to plow through some of these uh, in order here. The first thing is this issue again, the Bible being treated as though it's one source. Uh, now, when you, when you treat the Bible as one source, like you take the book, here I got the Bible. It's all these different documents, but I'm going to act like it's one source. And so if I can sort of, um, you know, defame this one source as a whole, I can just set the whole thing aside. And again, the case for the resurrection never gets off the ground, at least uh, the parts of it that, that were drawn from uh, confirmation that we have within those documents. Um, you can just end your research right there. The Bible's a bad source, end of discussion. We're not going to even consider the, the resurrection anymore at that point. Now, there's several problems with this. One, I'll give you three. One, the Bible, if it was a bad source, you could still get information from it. Historians get information from bad sources all the time. And there's lots of stuff that's revealed in documents where they weren't necessarily wanting to reveal things, right? But they just couldn't hide the fact that it was there. Two, second problem, it's not a bad source. <laughs> that's a whole different video. That's like a whole different hundred videos to talk about that. But three, the third problem is this, it's not one source. The Bible's not one source. Long before the documents of the Bible were ever assembled under one cover, these books existed independent of each other. They represent multiple sources from different authors, and this subtle difference is a really big deal. When we see something written in Hebrews and Luke and Romans and 1 Peter, what we're seeing is something that was written by four different authors at different times. And we see agreement there without obvious collusion. That means something. This matters, right? It doesn't mean you just take everything without critical evaluation, but it also means you don't throw it out without critical evaluation. We have to think about these issues. Historically speaking, you don't speak of the Bible. You talk about Matthew and Mark and 1 Corinthians and Galatians, and you consider each source separately. So um, there's the, the issue right there, but the, the Bible is not one source. Matt also implied something really odd here, and it was very totally off topic to the debate, but it was about how we got the New Testament. And so I just wanna mention it because it was not remotely accurate. So Matt implied that the books that went into the New Testament were picked by Athanasius of Rome. I don't know what hand collected means, but they were picked by Athanasius of Rome in the fourth century when he just made a list and everyone quote, just accepted it. And up until then, there were other books that people totally thought like there was just as much acceptance of these other books, but someone just like got rid of those and kept these ones and they didn't agree with each other. This is just a painfully bad misrepresentation of history. Now, I am not gonna walk through this today. It's just 
TMI, right? It's just too much information. But in the video description, I put a link to a playlist where I do th I have three videos where I go through this and I talk about the first century through the fourth century, the development of the canon, and that's what I'll put. Uh, I'll put the development of the canon. There'll be a link there if you'd like to get more about that. I even deal with the Shepherd of Hermas, which Matt mentioned, completely mischaracterized the data. It's just not even. It's not even remotely close to the reality of the situation. Um, now, I'm not saying Matt did it on purpose, but because it happened. I want it to be unhappening to you. <laughs> so, um, okay. Another thing about these implications in this clip that I just share with you from Matt is Matt offered just a list of possibilities. And this is something that happened a lot in the debate, like random possibilities as though the fact that something could happen means it's likely that it did happen. Um, and, and that is a, a debate tactic, of course. And we see that a lot, especially from street epistemology group, uh, people that are part of the street epistemology group. Um, so it goes like this. He says, the Bible may not be the most accurate. Well, and the Bible might be the most accurate. and But, you know, it may still not be accurate enough. And then he says, well, but maybe it is accurate, but it still has some problems. Or maybe, here's another possibility, maybe it's entirely accurate and we may still have good reason to not believe it. If you find this persuasive, then... Don't watch debates, you know. Um, this kind of thing is not good. This kind of thing is not helpful for finding truth. In fact, if you didn't notice, multiple of his own possibilities here were contradicting each other. I mean, I would assume that coming to the debate, Matt has had this debate more than I have, right? That he's going to have a thoughtful, robust de description of what he think really happened in the first century, that he's going to understand these things, that he's not going to say maybe, maybe, maybe. He's going to say likely, likely, likely. And yeah, lists of possibilities don't mean much. Uh, no details, just casting doubt with little justification. He won't even take a position on any of these possibilities. And we see this a lot in the debate. Um, while I don't know that I handled it well in the debate, um, I want you to, to spot it so that you won't be influenced by possibilities as if though they're likelihoods. So in my opinion, this kind of thing especially impacts the uninformed. Um, yeah, and I don't want you to be confused by it. So alternate theories, alternate theories, like the ones he just presented in a list, they bear a burden of proof. And making a long list of conflicting possibilities might confuse people, but it shouldn't bear any weight in their minds. What we should do is compare each hypothesis that we've got here to the evidence and see if it holds up not just have an unending list of possibilities. There's gotta be a comparison. There's gotta be evidential support. So possibilities are interesting, don't get me wrong. It's interesting to talk about it, but they shouldn't persuade you. You can bring a careful case built on evidence and people can always counter it with, well, what if this and what if that and what if this and what if that? But I'm not interested in just what ifs. I wanna know why I should think that's actually the case. I wanna know what you're gonna do when you compare it to the actual evidence. Okay, I'm gonna shift gears here a little bit and we're gonna talk about double standards. Um, I noticed a number of double standards that um, Matt had in the debate, and I want to bring those out because um, I think what they do is they reveal that you're not being fair with the evidence. So we're going to talk about the first one, and that is enemy attestation. And it comes from um, Matthew 28. Matthew 20, I'll put that up on the screen right here for you to read. The idea is that this passage you're looking at, um, for those of you who are on podcast, I'm, I'm sorry, this is all on YouTube if you want to see the visuals um, and get the links in the description. But Matthew 28 talks about enemy attestation. That's certainly what I claimed in the debate. Um, I, it, was, it was one of several lines of evidence that gave us reason to think that the empty tomb is a real historical event. It wasn't the whole argument. It was just one piece of evidence in that puzzle. And uh, Matthew 28, it just talks about how there were guards at the tomb and how they claimed that the, the body was stolen um, and there was bribery that went on and all this kind of thing. Uh, I'll just read it to you here. It's while they were going... Behold, some of the guards went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And here's a really interesting part of the verse 15. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now there's two different ways that you could go about inferring that there's enemy attestation that we're learning about from this text. One is thinking that it's an accurate account. Okay, if it's an accurate account, obviously the enemies were saying the tomb was empty, right? And if the enemies are willing to admit it, then that makes it much more likely that it's true. The second way is that you actually take a very liberal stance here toward the Bible and you say, 
oh, the Bible's just been totally changed. They were altering the story as time went by. And the guard story was added as a response to the fact that they were claiming the disciples stole the body. So that this, again, lends credence to the fact that there was a missing body. So whether you have the more conservative, more liberal position, you still get the empty tomb. That's the point. Now I want to play for you a clip of how Matt characterized this, his response to me claiming that there's enemy attestation. Keep in mind the category of the review this is under is double standards. Here Matt says there's no enemy attestation. Later on, he seems to violate that standard. So listen up to the clip not enemy attested to in Matthew 28. Matthew 28 reports something that if it were true would account as an, you, you have to assume that it's accurately reporting this. Okay, that let me where, where is the actual enemy attestation? Because historians, when they view something, if there's two accounts and an actual enemy written account affirms something, that is an enemy attestation. The winning side writing that an enemy affirmed it is not an enemy attestation. That is just flatly false. Confidence is very persuasive, and Matt is very confident that this is not enemy attestation, and that's not even how it works when historians do this kind of thing. So I think that this betrays, uh, again, that he's casually dismissing things rather than carefully examining the evidence. Uh, Gary Habermas and Mike Lacona are two examples of scholars who explicitly call this enemy attestation. I contacted Ben Shaw, uh, who is currently getting his PhD in this field, and he said that it's a, I'll just give you the quote, he said it's a nuanced version of enemy attestation, since it comes from a sympathetic source, but the claim is also found in Justin Martyr and Tertullian. Plus, there is the phrase, to this day, which gives the impression that it is common knowledge. And so this is kind of like how they're working through, and it is a type of enemy attestation. Um, obviously, it's recorded in the Gospels. No, I wasn't hiding that fact. I don't think there's anything wrong with that fact. Um, okay, but why do I bring this up to say that Matt has double standards? Uh, obviously, he's, in dis he's disagreeing with historians here and acting like he's representing historical research, but why do I say it's a double standard? Well, I'm going to play the next clip, and this next clip is um, where he postulates how the account of the blood and water coming out of Jesus may have entered the story Listen to what he says about what enemies were saying in this clip. Um, early on, there was the, the, the notion of this swoon theory. Basically, enemies of, of, of Christianity would say, well, how do you know he was really dead? And of course, they would point to the record and they would highlight the fact that a soldier stuck a spear into his side and he bled until there was water. Now, the question is, did that actually happen? Was it in the original narrative, or was this something that was added as an exaggeration to be convincing? Because when somebody says, how do you know he was dead, you've got to come up with some explanation. And saying, oh, he was stabbed and he bled and, until he bled water, that would seem to be convincing to people if they accept it. Now, at that moment in the debate, we were I wanted to go after the blood and water thing, and I don't think I even noticed the double standard that, that I'm seeing here. We'll talk about the blood and water and the medical research and stuff like that. Uh, that moment in the debate in a moment. But um, but here he's postulating like, hey, um, I'm inferring from the text that there's possible enemy attestation, the influence of enemy attestation on the text, on the details about the spear and the blood and the water being poured out. Now, on one side, I want to encourage this, right? This is like historical research, right? He didn't just say it's a claim and throw it away. He's instead analyzing and considering like what could have caused these claims to arise. So that's good. This is, this is we're counting for the data, right? But on the other side, um, this is super duper vague, right? Oh, there's a piercing, which seems historically consistent, like with what the Romans did, but he's trying to think of how it got into the text when the obvious answer is, well, Jesus was just pierced. Um, but with Matthew 28, where we have just plain statements about enemy attestation, he throws it out as completely irrelevant and not enemy attestation. No... There's no first century evidence, by the way, of a swoon theory. There's no evidence of any kind that there was a swoon theory in the first century or that people were suggesting that Jesus never really died. We don't have that any time in the first century. Um, there's nothing explicit, and there doesn't even seem to be anything implicit that you might read into the text to find. Um, I don't know where Matt got that from. Uh, the real popularity of the swoon theory happened about 200 years ago, and then it and then it it died. It didn't even swoon. It died. It's not coming back, right? <laughs> the swoon theory is quite dead at this point. So the problem I have here, and, you, and I want you to watch this when you deal with um, 
conversations about what I mean, even within Christians to Christian conversations, or you're dealing with Christians to non-believers and trying to talk to them about the the text of what Scripture says, that sometimes people are willing to read between the lines of the text and find little hints here and there, but they're not willing to just read the lines of the text themselves. And it's good to notice these kinds of things. Um, yeah. It's good, just good to notice that kind of stuff. Okay, because of the authoritative and persuasive nature that Matt has in this debate, and that I don't feel like I counter that well enough in my own opinion, um, I think it's my responsibility to point out some more of his historical analysis. And that is specifically in the fact that it comes from a lack of preparation. Uh, Matt, it seems, doesn't research into these things. I know that when he debated Mike Lycona, he mentioned that he didn't even read Mike Lycona's book. And during our debate, uh, I thought I wanted to press him on this. The idea that maybe he's not really even looking into these things. He seems unaware of the historical canon, of the nature of claims versus evidence, of a bunch of specific things when it comes to the history of things. So I wanted to ask him, did you prepare? Do you Have you really researched these things to figure out what happened? So here's a clip of, of what Matt said there. The only other question that I'll get out real quick if I can is I just wanted to know, um, have you tried to examine like what historically happened in the first century to come up with like a real like sort of thoughtful, not vague, but like a thoughtful explanation for the evidence that's available? So I don't know how what was going on in the first century would necessarily be relevant because for I'm referring my to Jesus and his resurrection wow. specifically, just I, I don't want you to spend a bunch of time on it. A misunderstanding there. Sorry. Go ahead. So the short answer to your question is no. And the reason for the no is that what I have are a bunch of claims. Okay, I, I've continued the, the explanation for the no. He goes on to more stuff. He kind of shifts subjects a bit. But the idea is this. Um, Matt doesn't do the research here. Um, and this is often the case you're going to find. So maybe when you're engaging with people one-on-one -on -one conversations, debates obviously is a pretty intense thing, but one-on-one -on -one conversations and people make sweeping statements like about the canon of scripture, or the Bible, or there's no evidence for that, is to push them a little bit on it, you know, and just be like, well, how do you know that? Like, have you researched this kind of thing? Have you really tried to figure it out? I mean, I can understand why Matt doesn't bother trying to explain the evidence, right? If you thought that these are just claims, you wouldn't really work very hard to figure them out either. You would think that the first century records are not really all that relevant because they're just claims. And I can see why he thinks that. That's a mistake. That's a misunderstanding of history. But I get it. I get why he doesn't do the research. But it also seems um, that he's willing to make these bold statements about the facts of history without having done the work. And while thinking that the historical documents themselves are not really evidence of anything. So how does he know anything from history? It, it just starts to get really confusing. Because Matt just talks as if he has this knowledge, and that is very persuasive to people, but but perhaps not um, not good. In the discussion, in particular, about the blood and water being poured out, I got the impression that Matt hadn't read up on the topic, and so I asked him, uh, "Are you familiar with the medical research on this topic specifically?" And it led to this moment right here. Are you familiar with the medical research that's gone into this content specifically about the death of Christ, the blood and water being poured out. I don't know. Am I familiar with the medical research on the blood of Christ? There is none. It's, I, I think you're purposely marginalizing what I just said. I, I, I'm trying to understand it. Okay, so when Jesus was pierced, blood and water poured out. Sure. And it seems to have one of two causes. Either the pericardium around the heart was pierced, in which case blood and water would pour out, or Jesus had died through the typical way someone dies on the cross, asphyxiation, and then the, uh, the water in the lungs was gathering as a result after his death. So the piercing would have confirmed it. And sure. I mean, the purpose of the piercing would be to confirm it. It would be to get blood and water to pour out to make sure the guy was dead. Yeah, and this is a prime example of what I objected to in the opening. The way that you go about phrasing things is, and I apologize, but considering I've already been uncalled on the carpet for zombies, sloppy. Because when you ask me, about are you familiar with the medical research involved with the piercing of Christ? The answer is there is none. If instead it would be, do you understand what the reason for that might have been or what the explanations for why there might have been blood and water? Yes, of course I've heard about those things. So I can understand, and now that I've analyzed his stuff even more, I, I think I understand why it's bothersome to Matt. I don't think he's trying to be rude to me here. I think he really thinks that when I say medical research, I'm just I'm just trying to make things sound like evidence when they're really not. 
So this is from the Journal of the American Medical Association. You can look this up online. In fact, I put a link in the description. I'll put it under um, uh, the title uh, article on the blood of Jesus or something like that. On the blood of Jesus. That's what Matt said. That's not what I said. <laughs> I'll put it under the, the title like um, uh, on the physical death of, of Jesus Christ. So I'll, I'll put this article in there and you can check it out. Um, this is from 1986. This is not a new article. Okay. And this is stuff that in all honesty, a lot of us are well familiar with. He says, there is no medical research. The Journal of the American Medical Association is like the gold standard for medical journals. This is like a big deal. It's a published journal article that's important. And it's not the only thing that's been done on it. Another double standard moment, uh, let's go to another one here, was when Matt offered this principle for evaluating the reliability of historical texts. Now, my case wasn't built on the reliability of the Bible. That is reliable, but that wasn't my case. And I don't want to try to defend everything I'm not dealing with in the moment. Um, but here's what he said about um, how historical reliability doesn't really matter. So uh, I'll play two clips for you and you can hear Matt. He says it twice. But the fact that I say, I tell you 10 things and eight of them are correct tells you nothing at all about whether the other two are correct. Each of those claims has to stand and fall on its own merits and its own evidence. Confirming that somebody is accurately relaying elements of a story does not confirm the other elements of the story. Saying Some, that Zacchaeus, it does. I, what's that? Sometimes it does. No, it absolutely does not. It cannot. If I make 10 claims, the fact that eight of them are true tells you nothing at all about whether the other true are true. Okay, so this is- Nothing at all. Each claim is independent. Oops. <laughs> Let me do that again. Confirming that somebody is accurately relaying elements of a story does not confirm the other elements of the story. Saying Some, that Zacchaeus- it does. I, What's that? Sometimes it does. No, it absolutely does not. It cannot. If I make 10 claims, the fact that eight of them are true tells you nothing at all about whether the other true are true. Nothing at all. Each claim is independent. I wish I could speak with such authority. <laughs> um, okay, so this seems like a very black and white issue in, in Matt's perspective, right? Effectively, there ends up being no such thing as reliability, or at least when you're trying to confirm one fact by by saying that this text has become reliable. Corroboration, in a sense, doesn't mean anything when it when one text is evaluated. Um, so later in the discussion, Matt seemed to imply the opposite of this. Uh, he seemed to imply that I needed to prove that the Gospels were reliable in order to trust them on my specific 12 facts. Again, this is not what my case is based on. Um, those facts are held to by people who don't even believe the Bible is reliable. It, so it is, but they're wrong. But still, I don't want to fight for everything all at the same time. And so I based my case on facts which are agreed on by scholars and which are determined by independent lines of reasoning which don't rely on the reliability of the Gospels. But compare what Matt says here to what he said in the first two clips which I just played for you. This, however, has nothing to do with my case. There are, there are the scholars who would reject, I don't reject it, but who would reject that account in Matthew, they still would accept the facts that I've given you today. Yeah. So you're shifting the burden of proof to where I'm supposed to prove- I'm not. I was- scripture To talk I'm, about a historical case for the resurrection. I was asked to explain something and I'm trying to do so. The reliability of, of scripture in general is key to whether or not we can write about it on the other things. Okay. so. This is the exact opposite, right? The reliability of scripture is key to whether or not you can rely on, the other, rely on it on the other things. Yet this is the opposite of what he had said just a moment before. I say, I tell you 10 things and eight of them are correct, tells you nothing at all about whether the other two are correct. Each of those claims has to stand and fall on its own merits and its own evidence. My point of bringing this out is because he's using double standards and anytime you're using double standards, it's it's not going to lead you to true beliefs when you have one standard of evidence for the Bible or for Christianity or for religious claims and you have a different standard of evidence for non-religious claims or things that you already believe. Um, it was my mistake for not pointing this out in the debate. I wish I had noticed this in particular. It would have been very fruitful to bring it up. Um, now, the last thing I'll say about this particular like double standard thing. Um, uh, in Inspiring Philosophy, who's another YouTuber, uh, Michael Jones, he has done a video, or after a debate with Matt Dillahunty, he did a review as well, and I thought it was really good. Uh, I'm going to link that in the description below. It's called Matt Dillahunty versus Science, and it was just a clips being held together to show you how he's responding to scientific evidence, um, because this is consistent, that it, it's not... Um, Matt is biased against, it seems, religious claims to the point where he's willing to have these double standards even rejecting 
evidence that he would normally probably think is really good. Okay, we're gonna shift gears again, and now we're gonna talk about one of Matt's major objections to allowing historical evidence to tell us that a miracle occurred. And this is a really common objection. You will hear this, and you'll hear it again and again. Um, so here it is, one of Matt's main objections to identifying miracles from historical evidence was that it would create a slippery slope and that we would have to start embracing all kinds of miracle claims, even contradictory ones. Like, I have to just believe everybody's claims now because, well, here's uh, how he put it in his brief statement. Because once you believe there's a God who can do anything, everything fits. He was saying here that the, if the resurrection fits, well, then you're going to have to say everything fits. Now, the main way that Matt like unpacked this idea in the debate, if you remember, wasn't through just saying it explicitly, it was through offering illustrations, right? Um, this objection was communicated through un, what I would call unfair comparisons, but if we compare them thoughtfully, I think that actually helps the case for the resurrection. So the idea is that if you believe Jesus rose, the main idea that Matt would get at, if you believe Jesus rose, then you have to believe in Elvis sightings, Indian gurus that levitate, right? Uh, a, the, a viral video recently uh, about a, a fake resurrection in Africa that I have to believe all these things. So let's tackle the Africa example first. And then we'll tackle, um, I think the Elvis one will be next. Just the other day, or, or today actually, but a month ago I also saw it, there was a video that hit the internet of a resurrection occurring at a Christian meetup in uh, South Africa, I believe it was. There's a dude laying in a coffin, there's tons of people standing around, it's all on film and everything else, and the pastor's sitting over there praying him, and this guy sits up and everybody in the crowd freaks out. Now, I don't believe that that was an actual resurrection. I have no idea if Mike believes it's a resurrection, but the thing is, any Christian could look at that and say, yeah, I have no reason to doubt that that was a real resurrection because that's the kind of thing God can do, because they've started with the notion that God can and will and likely could uh, resurrect somebody. But if they say that that one we've got on videotape was not an actual resurrection, I want to know what their justification for that is, because they're accepting another resurrection that has less supporting evidence, has witnesses supposedly that you cannot interact with and investigate at all nothing okay um i can't i'm not gonna do with every single thing he said there i feel like i've already dealt with his presentation of, of of what the evidence is he says there's less supporting evidence that's certainly not the case but that's because he thinks it's all just claims right um but anyways uh this this misses again this misses the cumulative case for the resurrection entirely right it's understandably though right again matt and many atheists think there is no evidence for the resurrection except for claims so they naturally think that if i accept baseless claims then i better accept all baseless claims and this is just a, a straw man of the christian position um so two misunderstandings piled on top of each other. One, that all we have is claims. I've already dealt with that. And two, that we don't require the same kind of strong evidential case for other miracles as we did for Jesus' resurrection. So let's tackle the Africa example. Um, you can watch this video. You can just Google it like Africa resurrection video and you can check it out. I'm not going to embed it here because I, I think it'll probably get my video flagged or something for uh, copyright issues. I have permission to use the debate, so I'm using that. Um, but what you have here is... Um, a really weird video. Oh, it's weird. And the guy's moving from before the pastor even seems to be praying for him, before the pastor walks over there and does anything. That seems to be the case. Like, so this is just the, the first cursory glance. It just looks fake, right? But more specifically, um, we have no reason to think the man was ever dead. This is kind of a big deal, right? There's other issues. I did a little research on this, right? The mortuary where they claim the body was actually from is actually suing the pastor right now. Uh, the witnesses didn't seem to to hold their testimony under any great suffering or threat like the eyewitnesses in uh, the first century. They suffered greatly, were willing to die for it. Um, the whole thing just looks fake. And so we have, we have several reasons why this just doesn't work, right? Um, so this example is actually good for us. The man wasn't dead. Right? One of the key pieces of evidence in the resurrection is that Jesus had to be dead. This is why we put it up there and Matt kind of scoffed at it. Uh, I'll, I'll play the clips right here where Matt says that the death of Jesus is kind of unimportant, um, but it's really important. Here's the, here's the clips. The death of Jesus yeah. isn't in any way evidence for the resurrection. Yes, it's a required thing that he must have died before he was resurrected, but the fact that he died is irrelevant to whether or not he was actually resurrected because I just said that the death of Jesus has nothing to do with the resurrection, you know, apart from that it was necessary. Nothing to do with it apart from that it's necessary. The thing that we're missing, see, I believe that guy was alive. 
I think that video really helps prove that guy was alive. Okay, I could examine it more carefully and stuff, but it seems like it does. If you prove the guy was really dead, that's kind of a big deal. Um, now that he's alive again means, means a lot. And so the death of Jesus is kind of a really big deal in the case for the resurrection. Uh, many people don't tend to realize that. Okay, let's look at another example. Um, and this is about Elvis. Uh, here we go. If somebody came up to me today and said, hey, when Elvis died, he was resurrected a little while later. Here's a couple of national inquirers that show Elvis in a supermarket. Here's all the people who say they talked to Elvis after the dead. I'm, by the way, I'm not making this stuff up. If you go and research, you will find people that claim that they talked to Elvis after they're dead. Now, you can build a case out of that, and that's within the last 50 years. Now, again, this makes sense, right? I get it now. I get it now, right? He thinks that the evidence is so weak for the resurrection that he's like, why wouldn't you accept Elvis? Um, and he presents two particular facts. So let's compare this to the case for the resurrection. He says the National Enquirer showed Elvis at a supermarket. And I don't, it, whether these facts are accurate or not, it doesn't matter. It's, it's just an illustration, right? And that people who didn't know him later said they talked to him. People who didn't know him said that they talked to him after his death. They'd only knew him by reputation, right? So let's evaluate these facts. Let's consider them thoughtfully. Matt, uh, Matt says it came from the National Enquirer. The genre of literature that the National Enquirer is, is what? Do you know? It's a gossip rag. That's what it is. It's not considered good news. It's certainly not at the time that this Elvis stuff was going on. Whereas the genre of literature of the New Testament is none of it is gossip or fiction or legend. It's like the, the Gospels are Greco-Roman biography, which are largely accurate historical information. That's the kind of genre it's in. The New Testament epistles, that's also a type of genre we have to take seriously when it describes these kinds of things. Um, interestingly enough, the National Enquirer would have just showed pictures of him. And we all, if you remember this from seeing these things, they were like the side of his face, the back of his head, and things like this, right? Uh, the pictures that were floating around at the time. Uh, I wasn't alive, right? I saw it years later, just so you know. I'm not that old. Um, okay, so the witnesses, the the supposed witnesses were not friends, not family, and they weren't people who would even recognize Elvis or know if it was an impersonator or a real guy. And there were lots of impersonators were also aware of that as well. Whereas with Jesus, we have his brother, James. His brother, he knows who he is. We have his disciples who spent day in and day out with Jesus for three years. They would have known if this was the risen Christ or not. So this actually helps our case for the resurrection. There's no change of life like there was with the radical change of life of the disciples or James. There's also Paul who was an enemy of Christ, had every reason to persecute, and then he converts because he says he saw him alive. We don't have this kind of stuff going on with the Elvis stories. They're just stories. They're hokey, you know, urban legend kind of stuff. Um, so do they even think Elvis was resurrected? And the answer is no. No, the people that did fall in for this stuff, they denied that Elvis had ever died. So again, we have a denial of the death. We don't have a belief in a resurrection. Nobody thought Elvis rose from the dead as far as I know. So Jesus, he died in public, not in private like Elvis. And with uh, Elvis, they had a hard time believing he had died. With Jesus, as we read, they had a very hard time believing that he was still alive or he was back to life, I should say, more accurately. That was the difficulty thing, difficult thing for them to believe. The point is that we can investigate these claims. Do you see I can take this, this Africa example, this Elvis example, and I can investigate them and compare these claims to the type of evidence we have for the resurrection. Belief in God and belief in Jesus' resurrection does not require us to believe every miracle claim, right? We don't become gullible as a result of this. Uh, we remain open to investigate them thoughtfully. I can investigate them, which is wise to be open to think about evidence but I'm not required to be gullible as a result. If you're interested in more details on this, it's too much for this video. So what I did is I put a link in the description for a video that's called How to Think About Miracles, where there's an actual thoughtful presentation of how we can process and evaluate miracle claims, not just Jesus, but any miracle claim, and give you criteria for uh, evaluating them. It's a really interesting video. Okay, the last double standard. Here's the last double standard from Matt. Matt's position uh, involves a double standard when it comes to evidence for things Matt already believes in versus evidence for things Matt doesn't believe in. And my example here will be a car accident versus a UFO. Matt believes in car accidents, doesn't believe in UFOs, and he handles these things very differently. He begins talking about good standards of evidence, but he quickly shifts over to what I would consider to be double standards of evidence. And say, what are good standards of evidence? And good standards of evidence are ubiquitous. They, it doesn't matter. When something becomes believable isn't based on, well, 20 people told me, so it must be the case. That may be the case for 20 people witnessed an auto accident and you can compare their stories, but it doesn't mean that 20 people witnessing a UFO makes it believable, which we have cases of that happening. So 
we have typical standards of evidence. They apply when 20 witnesses see a car accident. And what Matt suggests is we take their, you know, their, their reports. We don't just take them and believe them, right? We evaluate them. We consider them. We compare them. And we do a, a analysis, right? And I agree. That's a good way to do it. Um, but if the same 20 people saw a UFO, we don't even evaluate their evidence. We don't even consider it. It just doesn't matter anymore. If that's the case, how would Matt ever know if a UFO was spotted? I mean, I can understand saying that you may want more evidence for affirming a UFO than you want for affirming a car accident. I get that, right? But that's different than saying that you have a different standard of evidence or what normally counts as evidence won't be considered evidence when it's something you're skeptical of, like a UFO or God, where you'll just disregard that evidence entirely. And that's what we encounter a lot. I hear all the time. There's no evidence for God. There's no evidence for God. And it's because what they consider evidence for other things, they don't consider evidence for God. And that is a double standard of evidence instead of uh, normal standards of evidence. So it's not handling evidence, it's ignoring evidence. It's finding a reason to push evidence out the door and say, we won't listen to what you have to say on this topic because this topic is something we don't believe in. So when it's evidence for something Matt accepts, its evidence will be thoughtfully considered, such as comparing 20 eyewitness accounts of a car accident to determine what happened. But when it's the same exact evidence for something like a miracle, it magically becomes claims. And that's the double standard. Evidence magically becomes claims when it's not about something Matt already believes in. Okay, to recap and finish the very long, long part of this video that's dealing with the history side of stuff, here's the recap. Matt's position seems to involve Matt's positions seem to involve a few specific tactics which serve to keep a person from properly weighing the evidence for the resurrection. That's calling evidence claims and dismissing it, right? Evidence magically becomes claims whenever it seems to point to God or a supernatural thing. Instead of inference to the best explanation, Matt seems to want inference to the non-miraculous explanation, denying historical facts, which doesn't mean that we have these facts with certainty, but they're reliably true, right? Matt just wholesale denies what's generally considered to be well-evidenced historical facts, and he recouches history very incorrectly. There's a mishandling of the idea of a cumulative case. Uh, there's an unjustified concern that we must either embrace or reject miracle claims rather than examining them thoughtfully and thoughtfully examining other, other miracle claims. It reinforces the idea that this project with the resurrection is like a doable thing. We talked about some of the double standards Matt had, which I don't bring up to pick on him at all. I actually feel a little bit awkward doing it, but because those double standards keep people from thinking clearly about the issues and these issues are too important to not think about clearly. Tactics like offering possibilities as if they're likely true without any supporting evidence, giving inaccurate descriptions of the evidence or the Bible or what we're capable of learning from historical research. My last thought uh, on all this historical stuff, just quick to mention, when Matt says the Bible's copies of copies of translations, yeah, that's a completely false mis misrepresentation. I will put a link in my description for uh, do we know what the Bible really said? That'll be the link to sh and three videos will be there explaining that we do. Okay, now that, that covers the history stuff that Matt brought up. But his biggest objection is coming up next. This is hugely important and it's something that could change your life if you have been following Matt's reasoning and you didn't catch this. So you might wanna take a break. You might wanna go do something fun and come back to the rest of the video later because what we're about to do is get really philosophical and it would be good if you had a fresh mind. I know I'm gonna go take a break because my brain is a puddle. The biggest issue in the debate, as far as I'm concerned, is how Matt used a philosophical rule to effectively make it impossible or nearly impossible to infer from evidence that God had done something. Let me explain Matt's rule and then why I don't think it's good philosophy. So this centers around the idea, and you're gonna have to really think this through with me. This is important that we carefully think about this. This centers around the question of when we can have the option of considering God as a possible cause of anything, not just a likely cause, a possible cause. I'm not sure how many people actually understood Matt's point here. So I'm gonna spend some time unpacking this and I've got some help from some philosophers to get me through this as well. I think that this, if there's one thing you get from this video, especially those of you who, who follow Matt, please consider these things. I think they're really important. And I've seen a bunch of Matt's videos and debates and 
um, I realized that there was this principle that he often uses to rule out God apart from considering the evidence for the resurrection. I thought this would come up, and so I put it in my opening statement. So here's a brief clip from my opening statement trying to anticipate this problem and um, consider it here as your introduction to the issue. There's another one you can only offer, and this is a quote from, from Matt from previous debate I heard. Uh, you can't offer a supernatural explanation until you prove the supernatural is possible. But this is, this is, this is the proof. This evidence for the resurrection is the proof that the, that something supernatural happened. So what we're doing is we're ignoring, we're saying the evidence won't count until you have evidence to prove the thing. But do, does anyone else see this? This is circular reasoning. I, I'm ruling it out. I'm not looking at the evidence. So these are ways of avoiding the evidence. <clears throat> so Matt doubled down on this idea later on in the debate, uh, very strongly doubled down on it, and he explained it a bit more and so I'm going to play a clip where he talks about that uh, that rule right here when I say something like in order to to reach to the supernatural as a potential explanation you would first have to show that the supernatural is real and can interact with reality I'm talking about just having a sound epistemology it's not the fault of sound epistemology that claims about the supernatural are unable to meet those standards so <clears throat> Now you got that hopefully in your head, and I'll talk about it in a lot more detail here. We're going to unpack this slowly, make sure we get it. But first, I just want you to see what epistemology is, because for a lot of you, this is going to be a newer word or one you don't traffic in very often. And for some, many of you, it's also going to be something you know better than I do. But epistemology is basically, um, you can you can look at the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. There's an article on it that you can read and get a ton of detail. But it's basically the study of knowledge and justified belief, or how do we know things? How do you come to know things? So when Matt's like, this is a sound epistemology, he's just saying, this is just the right way to come to know things. Um, I'm ruling out God from the beginning until you can show that God exists, demonstrate he's real and show he exists. And that's just sound epistemology. There's nothing circular about it. Mike's definitely wrong here. This is kind of what he's communicating. So if someone were to say this is a good epistemology, what they're saying is this is a good way to come to know stuff. If they say that's a bad epistemology, they mean that's not an effective way to figure out what the truth is. That's kind of what they're saying here. So um, I'm going to play again real quick what Matt said about his epistemology, just in case for the few people who are like, I need some help with this. When I say something like in order to to reach to the supernatural as a potential explanation, you would first have to show that the supernatural is real and can interact with reality. I'm talking about just having a sound epistemology. It's not the fault of sound epistemology that claims about the supernatural are unable to meet those standards. So here, Matt seems to be saying that um, I can't consider, I say seems to be saying, he's definitely saying, I can't even consider God or the supernatural as a possible option or a candidate explanation. In another clip, he actually explains this as a precondition for considering God as a candidate for raising Jesus from the dead. Let me uh, play that clip now. Is there any known mechanism to support this? Claiming that magic did it, that, uh, oh, well, Jesus was special, or God is special, and God is able to, uh, you know, ex exempt things from w what we understand to be the, the laws of reality and these limitations, call it magic or, or whatever you want. Uh, it's a case of special pleading, and you would need to demonstrate that this is an actual viable candidate explanation. We put together all the facts. You list the candidate explanations for this, and that's all you get to pull from. Because if the candidate explanations are conspiracies, which we know occur, legend, which we know occurs, mistakes, which we know occur, uh, exaggerations, which we know occur, and all these other things, and then resurrection, something that we have zero supporting evidence for. We have lots of claims but nothing to show that this ever did happen or could happen. You don't get to include that. Here's one more clip where he says something similar. You, ha you, you may be able to confirm the event, but you have not established what the cause is, and you could never establish that the supernatural is the cause merely by ruling out other candidates because you first need to establish that the supernatural is a candidate. Okay, so here's the results. If I put up my case for the resurrection again, here's the results of Matt's philosophy as applied to the case for the resurrection. That is, the resurrection, if it's a supernatural event, you can't you can't say it, right? In, in particular, you can't say God is the one who did it. So it's no longer a candidate explanation. It might well explain the evidence. Like if you could present it, it may really well explain those 12 facts. 
but it can't even be put on the board as a candidate. I already dealt with his historical issues where Matt would sweep away all the 12 facts and say they're just claims. Um, I, I dealt with uh, him breaking the cumulative case apart, which would allow hallucination to seem more likely or conspiracy or legend to seem more likely. But when you put the t case together, no, th those things don't work. But now I'm dealing with the heart of the issue, which is where he rules out the idea of God without considering the evidence in the case for the resurrection of Christ. That's the effect it has. That's the impact that this rule has. This is a really big deal. If Matt's correct, and this is a sound epistemology, then God raising Jesus or any argument for God, for that matter, doing anything, it just seems completely off the table. I mean, I love philosophy, okay? But I'm not a philosopher. I'm not certainly not a trained philosopher. So I wanted help with this issue to unpack Matt's epistemology. So I contacted a couple philosophers who have special interest in epistemology in particular, and I talked it over with them. Um, and they don't, I'm not saying they agree with everything I say in my video here. I just dealt with this one specific issue with them. And um, I wanted help with three specific things, three things with Matt's epistemology. Number one, help me understand Matt's position so I won't misrepresent it because I knew I would be accused of that, probably no matter what. So I'm gonna to try to be very careful to present it correctly. The second thing I wanted was to evaluate his principle and thoughtfully consider it with the help of qualified professionals, even if it was just a little bit of help to just see, does this principle really work? And then finally, number three, to find out if this was really sound epistemology or anything that epistemologists generally use as a valued principle, because Matt says it, says it is. So is he right? Is Matt right? Or is he off the reservation when he says this is sound epistemology? Uh, one of the gentlemen I talked to who lent me a little bit of his time is Andrew Moon um, from uh, the Virginia Commonwealth University. He's a philosopher who has special interest in epistemology, and he helped me make sure that I did understand Matt correctly, that I understood what he was saying accurately. So looking at direct quotes from Matt during the debate, he helped give a charitable formalization of Matt's epistemological principle, or to put it in an easier phrase, to make clear what Matt was saying. This is what we came up with. We called this principle two. Um, so principle two was, one can infer that X is a reasonable explanation of Y only if one has shown that X exists and that X interacts with reality. Now at this point, I, I might recommend you pause the video and you consider and think, what did Matt say? Is Mike, is Mike accurately portraying him? If Mike's wrong, what did he get wrong? I'm confident this accurately represents what Matt said, and I've heard him say it in multiple locations and times and was able to, I think, give a good principle here. So we can ask now if this is accurately it. Is this a good rule for how people should think about reality? Keep in mind how it functions. It serves as a check, which doesn't allow certain kinds of explanations into the pool of what Matt calls candidate explanations. You have this idea, it can't get into the pool until it first passes the test of this principle, principle two, we called it. So in my case, I wanted to say that Jesus' resurrection is the best explanation and that if Jesus rose, God's the best candidate for the job. God did it. And this is because of the historical religious context. I got into that in the debate, but it, it, it just, it's on you, man. If you want to say Jesus rose from the dead, but it wasn't God who did it when all the the uh, religious context around the event, his claims, his uh, apparent miracles, if, if not real, at least apparent miracles, and uh, Old Testament context, all this just pushes the idea that this was God who did it. So this would serve to say, forget that, Mike, God's not an option. You can't even put him up as an option. So now that we've got Matt's principle on the operating table, let's consider how it functions as a general rule, or what Matt called a sound epistemology. First, let's look at how this impacts a search for God in particular. If God is X, the reasonable explanation, but he can't be applied to any to Y, any evidence, then um, how does it affect our search for God? It seems pretty obvious. The natural conclusion of this line of reasoning, where you must prove God is real and can interact with reality or the world before even thinking about God as an option or potential explanation for any evidence, it serves to keep us from reasonably inferring God's existence. What do I mean? Well, we've already seen it applied to the resurrection. Case closed, resurrection, whether it happened or not, God can't be used as a possible explanation. But now let's apply Matt's rule to some other classical arguments for God. So there's cosmological arguments for God. So if I was to say, hey, we have scientific and philosophical reasons to think that the, the universe really had a beginning. It started to exist at some point in the past. 
and that God, being spaceless, timeless, immaterial, all-powerful, and personal, he would well explain, in fact, best explain, how it came to exist. Matt's principal would jump in and say, "Uh uh-uh, stop right there. God isn't even a potential explanation for the universe beginning to exist. Why? Because you first have to prove that God exists, show he exists, and that he can interact with reality. Well, so I bring the argument for moral facts, and I say, that you know the existence of moral facts, God's the best explanation for the existence of moral facts. And the response is, no, Mike, God's not even a potential explanation for moral facts, no matter how good you think the evidence is, because you first must demonstrate that he exists and can interact with the world. So I give the argument from design, that the universe shows strong signs of fine tuning, which are best explained by a purposeful designer. Uh, Frank Tipler, the prominent physicist, he was moved from being an atheist to a theist because of the data in astrophysics that pointed to a designer. But if he had Matt's rule in mind, he would still be an atheist because the evidence of fine tuning would never make any difference. The evidence wouldn't make a difference. Matt's rule would say, nope, you can't offer God as the candidate explanation for the fine tuning of the universe until you first show that he exists and can interact with reality. So I hope you understand this serves as a trump card for any known evidence that has ever been presented for God's existence that I'm aware of. But it starts to lead you to wonder, if I can't use any of those things, then how do I show God exists? I mean, how do I how do I make this principle real? How do I show God exists and can interact with reality if all the evidence I bring to show it isn't allowed to show it because of principle number two over here? So it's a trump card, but it's a trump card that leaves us with no back door, no way to know that we're wrong, no way to actually compare evidence. When asked what would show God exists and interacts with reality, Matt's response, if you remember from the debate, is he doesn't know. He's not sure what would show God exists and can interact with reality. He just has no idea. This seems to make his position on atheism immune from the influence of normal reasoning with evidence, normal inference to the best explanation. It's like saying, like, la, 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 I can't hear you. Well, what could be wrong with a principle like that? You, you could never find out you're wrong. How does Matt find out he's wrong? That's the idea. Dr. McGrew, another one of the philosophers I I talked to about this, he pointed out to me the importance of asking, um, how is he going to discover he's wrong? How's Matt going to know he's wrong? If this principle is not accurate, how is he going to find out? Well, we kind of asked Matt this in the debate. Hey, Matt, how would you find out you're wrong? What could convince you God exists? And this was his response. Is there any conceivable evidence in your mind that would give you the resurrection of Christ and God did it. Is there any conceivable evidence? I have no idea, as I've said umpteen times, and as you paraphrased me at the beginning, what that evidence would be. <clears throat> now the question here, he starts to shift the burden a little bit. The question is not what would convince Matt. It's not that, it's rather what evidence would give us that God exists because we should at least have a theory or an idea of how to demonstrate these things in reality, right? If there really were unicorns, then I might be able to demonstrate their existence. There's ways of doing this. So the question is not what would convince Matt. It's how any evidence for God can meet the criteria of Matt's, quote, sound epistemology. Basically, if God exists, those who hold to Matt's principle will be prevented from discovering it through any conceivable means that either I can think of or that Matt can think of. He can't even think of a possible way to meet the need of principle number two, which says, hey, You cannot give God as an explanation until you first prove he exists. Of course, that is how we usually prove things exist. We give them as the best explanation for the available evidence. The philosopher William James wrote the following. A rule of thinking which would absolutely prevent me from acknowledging certain kinds of truth, if those kinds of truth were real, would be an irrational rule, right? Because there's no way back. It's an indefeatable atheism. Francis Bacon, who has been called the father of empiricism, not the father of Bacon, that's Kevin, says this, we have set down as a law to ourselves to examine things to the bottom and not to receive upon credit or reject upon improbabilities until there hath passed a due examination. Matt's rule is rejecting on improbability before the examination takes place. So back to the philosophers who helped me with this, and I really appreciate their help. Dr. McGrew tried to apply Matt's epistemology, his principle, about what qualifies as candidate explanations to black holes to demonstrate how would this rule affect us if we applied it to things other than God. 
Here's how that conversation went. Dr. McGrew says, if that principle were really a bit of sound epistemology, it would not block us from making inferences in science that just about everyone agrees are reasonable. So he gives a hypothetical conversation between two people, party A and party B. So A says, do you know that there are some objects so massive that we cannot see them? B says, nonsense. It's not nonsense at all. You see, they're called black holes. And ha, prove to me that it's even possible for there to be an object so massive you can't see it. Well, I don't know about proof, but there are stars down near the center of our own galaxy that are spiraling inward toward the same central point in a way that is best explained by the existence of a black hole there. Person B says, nope, you're not allowed to use that as an explanation. You have to prove to me that it's possible first. A says, again, I'm not sure what you mean by prove there, but the very fact that the hypothesis explains things that are not otherwise well explained is evidence for their existence. B says, nope, you can't use it. A says, that doesn't seem like a reasonable rule to follow. B says, it's not my problem that your hypothesis of black holes can't meet my requirements. It's your problem. This is this is my debate with Matt Dillahunty, <laughs> in a nutshell. Uh, Dr. McGrew went on to say, if it were a if it were sound, if Matt's principle were sound, it would not block reasonable inferences. It does block reasonable inferences. Therefore, it is not sound. Dr. Moon, who was not weighing in on my debate, he was only giving information on just this one principle. He says um, that Matt's principle, uh, if it was applied in science would have a very negative impact. I'll quote Dr. Moon. He says, uh, Principle 2 seems to disallow how scientists have come to believe in electrons. Generally, it rules out how we've ever come to believe in something new by way of inference to a reasonable explanation. What am I saying? I'm saying Matt's epistemology has a fatal problem. It blocks us from well-trodden paths of discovery in order to keep us from using those paths to find God. And that is exactly what it does to Matt. It blocks him from discovering the truth about the resurrection and the truth about God. And that's what it does to you if you swallow it. Please don't swallow it. It's not good epistemology. Now, I brought up problems with Matt's rule about candidate explanations in the debate, um, though not as eloquently or thoroughly as Dr. McGrew and Dr. Moon did. Um, Matt's response to me was to forcefully declare that he has a sound epistemology and that it's just good sense he didn't refute my points. He just said I was wrong. So here's that clip again. I want you to hear it one more time. When I say something like in order to to reach to the supernatural as a potential explanation, you would first have to show that the supernatural is real and can interact with reality. I'm talking about just having a sound epistemology. It's not the fault of sound epistemology that claims about the supernatural are unable to meet those standards. But is it really sound epistemology? I asked Dr. McGrew about this. I said, am I safe in saying this epistemological principle is not something well known or respected amongst epistemologists? And Dr. McGrew said, yes, it is not any kind of standard principle in epistemology. And it looks like an attempt at special pleading. What's special pleading? Special pleading is applying standards, principles, or rules to other people or circumstances while making oneself or certain circumstances exempt from the same critical criteria without providing adequate justification. Special pleading is often a result of a strong emotional belief that interferes with reason. Well, the idea is this. Obviously, Matt's not going to apply this principle to everything because he would have to discount so much knowledge. He's only going to apply it to God. That's what makes it special pleading. I have a principle that would destroy my knowledge if I applied it everywhere. But if I apply it to just God, it'll only destroy my knowledge of God. That's the impact of Matt's sound epistemology, uh, referred to here as special pleading. So Matt's principle seems to only apply to what he calls supernatural things or non-physical things. Otherwise, he'd be denying everything. So Dr. McGrew, uh, he anticipated this and he said... And he said, uh, Dr. McGrew anticipated this, and he said, why should the fact that something is natural in the sense of being a hypothetical physical phenomenon make it possible in a sense that a non-physical phenomenon is not possible? Impossibility claims carry a burden with them. It's up to him to show the logical contradiction in the supposition of a claim that he wants to dismiss as impossible. Until he does that, uh, prima facie, they're on the table just like anything else. They may not wind up being the best explanations, 
or they might. So let me translate if anybody didn't catch that. God is back on the table unless Matt can provide a compelling reason why God can't be on the table. Matt has tried to remove our evidence. Matt has tried to remove our explanations. Matt has tried to remove the ability to even think about God as an explanation of the evidence. And all of those things have failed very miserably. And that is what I hope you got from the debate. So God's back on the table. Finally, Dr. Moon said this. Once we see that principle two, again, that's Matt's principle. I'll throw it back up just for you guys to see it. Once we see that principle two is false, it seems that there's no reason why supernatural beings would be special. There are general criteria for when someone can infer something by way of reasoning to the best explanation. There's a whole area of philosophy on this, and nobody wants to rule out supernatural entities in principle. And so I'm hoping that this serves as a good, effective debunking of probably the biggest reason why Matt can't find God. At least philosophically, there's all kinds of other reasons that could be going on in a person's heart but this I can tackle uh, with some help from philosophers. So the point for viewers is that you recognize the power of an authoritative and intelligent sounding statement like that's sound epistemology. It seems good, but when evaluated, it falls short and seems to indicate that one of Matt's central principles for rejecting God is fallacious, which means God, again, he's back on the table. Matt's skepticism is just dialed up when it comes to God and dialed down when it comes to other things for any viewers. Uh, that you feel this philosophy stuff is a bit tough to follow and maybe you, I lost you a little bit along the way or maybe you just want a fun video that will help explain this kind of stuff in uh, in a more simple fashion um, and really, really well as well. Um, and that is a video I linked below called Scooby-Doo and the Silly Skeptic and that's from Act 17 Apologetics. David Wood did a super good job with that video. I do recommend you watch it um, whether you need the help or not. It's just a great video. So let me now address before I wrap it up, which I'm looking forward to wrapping it up, a possible miscommunication during the debate. Um, now that I've explained the epistemology issue, this will hopefully make sense. In the debate, uh, Matt said that I said, Matt doesn't care about evidence. And he became visibly upset by this. Um, in a debate review video that he recently put out, he said it again, that I accused him of not caring about the evidence. I'm quote, you can quote me there, I'm quoting him. So you can quote me quoting him there. Mike, does, Mike says, I don't care about the evidence. But if you listen carefully to what I said, that's not what I said. You won't hear me saying Matt doesn't care about the evidence. You'll hear me saying that effectively, because of Matt's epistemological framework, because of his rule, his principle, effectively, evidence doesn't matter. Translated as Matt, you don't care about evidence, but this is entirely different. At first, I actually thought Matt did this on purpose. Um, in the moment, I was like, how does he not know what I'm saying? But um, but later I, I realized, I think he just honestly thought I was just insulting him. And I totally did not mean that. And maybe I was not careful enough with my words. And for that, if that's the case, I'm sorry, Matt. That is not what I meant at all. Hopefully now it all makes sense. In fact, just to be uh, totally clear, um, here's what I meant. I'll say it very carefully. Given Matt's epistemology, which seems to be fallacious and to involve special pleading, God is unjustifiably barred from being considered as a candidate explanation for the evidence. Under Matt's principle, the evidence no longer factors in when asking the question of, did something supernatural happen? Effectively, the effect of this, the evidence doesn't matter. Not that it doesn't matter to Matt personally, but that it doesn't matter when applying this principle to the question of the resurrection of Jesus, because you're not allowed to consider God you're not allowed to apply it to the evidence until you somehow mysteriously prove that God exists. But evidence seems to be off the table for doing that. So Matt might say, um, don't say, Mike, that no evidence is good enough. Um, and that's true. He doesn't say no evidence is good enough. But every piece of evidence he can conceive of seems to not be good enough. So effectively, no conceivable evidence is good enough. I hope that that makes my point clear enough. Um, I'm going to give you guys real quick uh, a related issue dealing with science because it's just really cool and I think it should be in this video. It didn't come up in great detail in our debate, but it did a little bit and I want to cover it because I think it's on somebody's mind right now as they're watching. So, but Mike, you might say, what about science? Hasn't science shown that the miracles, that miracles are the least probable event and therefore they can never be said to be the best explanation or the most probable event? This is another sort of related way 
that people will rule out the resurrection or any miraculous event. I think that it was hinted at in this debate, but not spelled out. Matt referenced David Hume a couple times, and he's the guy who championed this kind of view. The argument goes something like this, and I'll, I'll apply it to the resurrection in particular. Uniform human experience, part one. Uniform human experience, or Matt might say science, tells us that dead people don't rise. Jesus, part two, Jesus was a dead person, right? Jesus was a person who died. Three, therefore Jesus didn't rise. And the existence of a stable order of nature, order of nature counts as evidence against the existence of miracles. And this is kind of like the same problem as before. It's like, how would you discover you're wrong if this is your view? Okay, so really briefly, because I have to wrap up this video and I want to go sleep, is I just want to explain how this works. Um, science doesn't tell us anything about miracles. It tells us about what normally happens. And um, we could define miracles in lots of different ways. I don't want to get into that. But science tells us what normally happens when physical things are interacting. So science doesn't show us that miracles don't happen. It shows us that if certain kinds of things do happen, then they probably weren't the result of naturalistic causes. Because naturalistic causes don't do that thing. They help us identify the miracle by contrast. You, you, you say this normally happens, something totally abnormal happened, no natural cause we can think of, and we know that we know the causes pretty well, could explain that. Let's start asking what else it could have been. Uh, here's an illustration that might help. A metal detector is really good at detecting metal, but it's really bad at detecting plastic. If you do find a piece of plastic and you scan it with a metal detector, it's not gonna tell you what it is. It will, however, tell you what it's not. It's not metal. The scientific method is good at detecting normal, natural causes, but bad at detecting supernatural ones. And the word supernatural is really clumsy. I don't want to get into that today. It may not be the best word for using this kind of stuff. But science is good at detecting naturalistic causes, right? If science is applied to a miraculous event, it's not going to tell you what it is. It's going to tell you what it's not, like the metal detector with plastic. It's not the result of normal physical interactions. That's the point. Those are just the limits of, of the scientific method. So we shouldn't say on one hand, right, God, do something no one else could do so that we'll know you're there. And then on the other hand, yeah, I won't believe that happened because that's the sort of thing that just doesn't happen. And evidence supporting it, you know, will be subject to abnormal skepticism. Like that's not, that's not reasonable. How are you going to find out you're wrong? Science doesn't provide proof against miracles. What it does is it provides a necessary backdrop from which miracles can be identified. So we can say, what caused Jesus to be raised from the dead, right? It wasn't uh, normal medical means. It wasn't uh, the normal physical ability to get back up at that point. No, the histori historical religious context comes in at that point. And we go, wow, his claims, his apparent miracles, his, the prophetic connection, it tells us that this was God who did it. Now you could say space aliens did it, but that's completely not evidence. There's no evidence to support that. That's just an ad hoc made up, you know, uh, assumption. So let me give a parallel example so you can understand how um, the historial religious data comes in after science has determined it wasn't a normal event. This didn't happen through natural means. So let's say that a man has cancer throughout his body. He'll die soon. The man suddenly gets better in a matter of minutes. Boom, he's better with no traces of the cancer. And everything we know about medical science says it couldn't have happened naturally. And then someone says to you, hey, what do you think caused that? I think we can honestly say, I don't know, right? Who knows? I mean, it probably wasn't natural, but who knows what did cause it? I mean, I, I wouldn't rule out super duper medicine. I mean, I just, I wouldn't rule out anything, but I wouldn't rely on anything either. I would just have to leave it an open question. Now let me give you the same scenario with a historio-religious context. So a woman has cancer throughout her whole body. She will die very soon. A pastor walks in and he prays over her in Jesus' name. And she is suddenly healed at that exact moment. With no trace of the cancer left in her body. Boom, she is better. That is a religious context that gives you clues as to how that healing took place. So you might say that a miracle seems highly improbable or that it has an inherent improbability, and that's fine. I'd probably agree that these things aren't, don't happen very often, right? But we shouldn't just stop there and ignore the normal way we investigate evidence. It's, it's improbable, fine, but we have to examine the evidence to see if it happened anyways. So that's the, how the historio-religious context works with Jesus. It is steeped in religious context that is very significant so that when you say, hey, here's the, here's the facts of history, here's the Here's the candidate explanations of what happened, resurrection. Okay, definitely the best explanation. 
What could have caused that? Given the historical religious context, yeah, that was God. Okay, so I had intended to do more, you guys, but I am just wiped out. This is the longest video I've ever done, at least for recording time, <laughs> and um, I am I'm I'm done. So um, I would encourage you. Here's a challenge, skeptics. Go back over the debate and consider the things that you see. And if you think there are substantive points, like real true substantive points that, that I could analyze, where I could find out I'm wrong on something that is really related to the resurrection of Christ, then uh, please send it to me. I'd like to hear it. I'd like to see it. If, on the other hand, you found that the rhetoric was more persuasive than anything else, well, then I do recommend that you reconsider your analysis of the debate. So let me know in the comments what you guys think about this analysis. Um, yeah, I think that it's uh, been a learning experience for me, uh, totally new to debate um, and uh, new to dealing with somebody who is Matt's particular style that I still don't know exactly how the best way to handle that is in the middle of a debate. Maybe I'll learn that as time goes by, maybe not, I don't know, we'll see. So to summarize my marathon video, my case was using normal historical methods right? Using just good history, using inference to the best explanation, which is good epistemology to show that God raised Jesus from the dead. Matt's case had bad history, had bad epistemology that even philosophers had trouble with, used vagaries, bad analogies, argued from authority, uh, or just used authoritative declarations, used off-topic things. I didn't even get into stuff like blood magic and his mockery of Christianity and all that kind of stuff. Like, those are all just side issues, really. They're, it's not what the debate's about. Um, but yeah, too long. <laughs> so I'm moving on. Um, so I hope this helps believers to see through some of the tactics that would lead them astray. Believers, you should not be stumbled or fearful when presented with bad history, bad philosophy, authoritative doubts, or even just a bunch of questions that carry skeptical implications that you don't know how to answer. And I hope that non-believers who've fallen for these tactics would see through them right now. Non-believer, if you're hearing me, maybe you need to be more skeptical of your skepticism. You owe it to yourself to take a look at the resurrection of Christ and to do so, trying to figure out what actually happened, rather than just trying to punch holes in the Christian case. That is a reckless treatment of history. Give it some thought. Because Jesus rose from the dead, and the evidence from the first century seems to confirm it.